in the know, non-stop Vikings talk. It's Purple Daily on Score North and scorenorth.com. The plan was that, that we were going to try to get him some snaps and then, you know, through travel and kind of the game day feel, uh, had it been a regular season game, he's, he's probably playing, um, but we just determined that we wanted to be smart with him. Um, he was just going to get, you know, very similar to some of our other second year guys like an Ed or uh, some of those other guys. He was going to get just minimal work, um, but he was still feeling some discomfort, didn't want to aggravate it knowing how big uh, this next week was. Um, but he was definitely, uh, you know, advocating to play all the way up until kickoff. Mm, there he is. Talking about uh, Asamoa. Yeah. Or is there a different pronunciation? Did you ever get, did you ever finish the oh. close the loop on the, you were doing some investigating. Yeah, I was. And I was going to, uh, in fact, I saw John Ekstrom of the, the uh, Vikings PR department this weekend, a few times at practice. And I forgot to check in with him. I will check. Wow. I'll be out there again, uh, probably with you for the joint practice on Wednesday. So yeah, yeah. I, uh, there was a, there were a lot of things as there always is uh post cleanup after a game to get to with the coach. So I was very preoccupied. On, How about you that. continue to pronounce it Asamoah? I will say Asamoa, and then Dex, you can find some other variation in the middle. BA. I'm just going to call him by his well, you initials. Know, you, know? you know what? Yeah. He's not practicing now. Out of sight, out of mind. Uh, Brian, Asa, Asa, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna work here anymore. Uh-huh. So we know, and people have sent us a clip that that he. So, but the official pronunciation guide by the team is Asamoa, but yep. he has he has pronounced it differently on different platforms, including a video from Vikings Entertainment Network. So we need to get to the bottom of how yeah. he wants us to pronounce his name because he's probably going to be a starting linebacker for the defense. Is he? Mm-hmm. Or is he? Oh, it's Judd's, Camp, he? Judd's Camp Nuts. Judd's, Judd's Camp Nuts. Oh, Are you sure about that? spoil anything. Are you so, sure about that? It's a big Monday here because it, it kicks off a couple things. It kicks off joint practice week. Wednesday and Thursday, we've got the Titans coming to town. It's going to be ferocious. There's probably going to be fights. We don't know, but it's going to be oh, super fun yes. at Vikings training camp. Um, and we're also kicking off. Uh, the first fundraiser that we've really done, the first big organized fundraiser here at Score North and on Purple Daily in several years. I think this might actually be the first one. I don't know that we, like, on 1500 ESPN, we did the annual uh, sports fantasy auction benefit encourage, Kenny. But today, we could use your help starting today all week long. Our goal is to raise at least $10,000 benefiting the Courage Kenny Rehabilitation Institute, which does an amazing job working with children and adults who experience life-altering injuries and disabilities. They offer innovative rehab therapy. Scornorth.com slash bid. And there are items you can buy straight up. There's items you can bid on throughout the week. And then you can also just donate if you would like to uh, out of the kindness of your heart. But from a Vikings perspective, dinner with the Purple Daily crew at oh, yeah. Red Rabbit is up for bid starting today. And also... Uh, just got word this morning. There's a Monday night football experience for lower bowl tickets yeah. to see the Vikings take on San Francisco, October 23rd. These are these are ninth row tickets, ninth mm. row tickets mm. in section 131, and you get a $200 gift card to Red Rabbit, Red Cow, uh, a Purple Daily beer set with four pint glasses and can koozies. Um, so there's all sorts of stuff at scornorth.com slash bid. We've already raised a thousand dollars this morning. Just people out of the goodness of their hearts, uh, donating here. So let us know, let us know, uh, if you want more details on these items and let us know if, uh, if you're able to, uh, to bid or buy, we'd love to hang out. You can hang out with Declan in a Pearl. So we have pairs of hey, sweet tickets for hey, Pearl Jam. Declan Don't take away from the experience by doing what you're currently doing. <laughs> I love Pearl Jam. Uh, but uh, I, on the secondary market, these tickets are going for uh, pretty ridiculous amounts. You can get a pair of sweet tickets and hang out with Declan for $500. Mm-hmm. Those are buy it nows, scornorth.com slash bid, and we'll keep you posted throughout the week, benefiting the Courage Kenny Rehabilitation Institute. Uh, the show here today is presented by our friends at TCL, one of the world's best-selling consumer electronics brands. They have a new lineup of award-winning TVs delivering the most entertainment with stunning resolution, all at an affordable cost. Learn more at TCL.com. Inspire greatness with TCL. Judd Zolgat inspires greatness every day with his training camp notes here. Mm. So, Judd, we will shut up and let you take over the show here with a weekend full of notebook items. In fact, you know what? I, I'll show you this on, on my phone. If you look, I've got 
I mean, look at that. That's two days of practice. Oh I'm surprised my it wasn't a uh, Dex oh tweets printout that I usually get on Monday that's, for Judd. That's the cleanup of the uh, of the game against the Seahawks. Wow. There were questions asked about the play on Saturday to the head coach of Ed Ingram, uh, Ty Chandler's practice ha- habits. There was uh, There's a lot to get to here. I want to start with the best news, though, because you know what I like to do. Everyone knows this. I'm an optimist by nature. I, I like <laughs> oh, to bring the— absolutely. Yeah. No I question. like to bring, I Twins, like to Vikings. start this show as much as possible with, hey, what's the good news? The Mr. Rogers of Purple Daily. Hello, neighbor. Mm-hmm. Won't you be my neighbor? Hello, friend. <laughs> um, and the good news is this. In a padded practice on Sunday, which the Vikings will go through a very light session today. They'll be off on Tuesday. And then, as Phil alluded to, Wednesday and Thursday, joint practices against the Titans. But in a padded practice, two-plus hours on Sunday, the best news was this. Brian O'Neill was in full pads with the first team for the first time taking part wow. since training camp started, which, and uh, post-practice, he said he feels, he feels great. He's right on track. So, you know, he's got a, he had a partially torn Achilles. So there's definitely concern there because he's six foot seven. But the good news is it looks like this thing is tracking for him to be playing and look, I don't think he's going to play a pre preseason game. I'm going to be curious to see how much work he actually gets against the Titans. But nonetheless, this looks like it's tracking for him September 10th to be the right tackle when the Vikings open against the Bucks. And that, my friends, is the best news that you can get if you're a Vikings fan. That's huge because we're still, yeah, we're like a month away still from the actual regular season. So the fact that he's in pads, he's participating, we'll see what he does against the Titans this week. And then he has almost a month to continue progressing forward. There's still the question, and I don't know that we're going to get an answer until we see him play in actual regular season games of, is he 100% of what he was before the injury? It's going to be tough to see that. Like, let's say he struggles in a Titans joint practice. Well, Mm -hmm. you can chalk that up to he hasn't practiced at all. So, but once we get into the regular season, then we'll find out, okay, how much of Brian O'Neill is left after now it sounds like they're not super concerned. We had our uh, Purple Daily uh, foot yep. doctor come in too, foot and ankle specialist, and say, "Hey, this isn't the Brian, this isn't the Phil Lodeholt situation from uh, you know a decade ago." So didn't but that, rupture, yeah, didn't rupture fully. So good news, good news. Yeah. So that was um, that was a move in the right direction because as we talked about when training camp started. Uh, Brian O'Neill was off to the side, basically working with the athletic training staff, and then he began to incorporate a little bit just as far as mental reps, but it looks like now he is, at least in practice, pretty much a full go for now. Uh, So the Saturday press conference with O'Connell was interesting because there was a lot to get to, and I actually um, asked two questions past the last question point. So, And he stuck around, answered them, But at the end, he's like, just joked, hey, I gave you a couple of extra questions. And I said, I didn't even get to ask you about Ivan Pace Jr. And the fact he is clearly ascending up your depth chart, to which he sort of just laughed. But it's no laughing matter right now. Brian Asamoa continues to sit out. Continues to sit out. And Ivan Pace Jr. He didn't deny it. Sounds like he didn't deny. No, he didn't because he knows it's. And and I said said the same thing to Flores on (laughs) Sunday. I said, it's clear this guy is ascending the depth chart. There's no question. You can't, like, I don't go to practice for for you to tell me that what I see is not real. But um, don't piss on my leg and tell me it's raining, right? Exactly right. (laughs) Or my head. Exactly right. But Brian (laughs) Asamoa, uh, who, who I think we all open training camp thinking he had that starting job locked down, is out with something. Uh, he has not participated in a practice since I think the first one he set out was the night practice they did, which is a very light one last Tuesday. But nonetheless, they are rotating linebackers in. But Ivan Pace Jr., this is no joke now because he's getting a ton of reps. And he is, it looks like he is making the most of his opportunity. Now, Brian Flores did say, he wants to learn. He works hard. He makes mistakes. He's like, it's not like he doesn't make mistakes, but it sounds like he is the attitude and the approach that a coaching staff loves. But I'm just saying, if Brian Asamoah stays out here, like if he does not get back soon, 
They they claim that they're getting him uh, prepared for the joint practices, but they've claimed stuff like that before. It does not happen. There is a race here for that inside linebacker position by Jordan Hicks, and it's going down the stretch, and Ivan Pace is breathing down Brian Osamo's neck, as far as I can tell. Can I just say that I love the KOC Judd relationship, and can we get like a mini sitcom or buddy cop situation here? Because like <laughs> now you have stories every week of of you and KOC. And I saw even Matt Matt Daniels addressed you by name, the special teams. Yeah, coach. we're buddies. Yeah, yeah. you guys are buddies too. I good saw guy. that. Real good guy. Yep. Well, we we had a long talk um, when his press conference got done last week about this fair catch rule and how oh. utterly stupid I God. think that rule You're is. Playing the game. And no, Did no, you guys, I'm not. Was that, it's was two that football like an, guys talking an, football? Well, was that like an off to the side discussion, yeah. or was it okay? Yeah, so, he's walking away from you're the playing podium. The game too. You are. He he's game, walking away from the podium l- last week, and I said, I said, this kickoff rule is going to be a pain in your ass. Time, time to play the judge. <laughs> it oh, is. Man. It's going to be so, a pain in his ass. Do you think? Give us a percentage chance based on just based on your observations, based on your experience as a former lead Vikings beat writer for the Star Tribune, yeah, yeah, 1500 you. ESPN.com. You've been around football for training camps for a long time. What is the percent chance Ivan Pace and injury stuff included that Ivan Pace Jr. is a starting linebacker for the Vikings against the Buccaneers in week one? Oh, I'm not going to make it. Absolutely, like huge, because th- there's still a lot of time for things to take place. But I think that there is a. I, I'm going to put it at twenty percent. Oh, oh wow! Wow! Oh, I that was be I'm going to put it at twenty percent. You thought it'd be higher I mean, or lower, Declan? I I thought he was going to say higher. It wasn't. I clearly he wasn't going to say over fifty, but I thought yeah. he was going to be more on the forty percent side. I thought he was going to say like I thought you were going to say five percent. It's actually higher than I thought. Oh, okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's fair. That's fair. But I mean, if Asamoa stays out here. There, there are, they're definitely trying. I will say this: they have been working in linebackers at different times. In, in fact, a couple of the first team rep, reps on at inside linebacker on Sunday went to a, a guy by the, by the name of Troy Reader, who they signed as a free agent from the Chargers, who actually was on the Rams Super Bowl team. Yeah. Um, but I don't think he's a threat. I, I think he's a special teams guy. And they did sign a guy, Tanner Vallejo. Yes. Uh, yesterday because mm-hmm. they lost the linebacker who was a special teams guy in the preseason game against the Seahawks. And so they did make a roster move there. I think Vallejo is going to be competing though solely for a special teams job. So yes, Ivan Page Jr., who was actually trending pretty well when Asamoa was still healthy, now has an even better opportunity. Hmm. Okay. So and so they um yeah Vallejo Tom Pelissero, I think, might have broken that from NFL Network, yeah. our good buddy here. Um, he did. And he he essentially referred to him as a special teams ace, not just a guy that's going to flip, but like could come in here and be one of their best special teams players if he, if he obviously makes the 53-man roster. Mm-hmm. They so definitely we'll were not pleased, and uh, Matt Daniels addressed this on Sunday as well, but they were not pleased with a lot of special teams plays. On Thursday, I think they had a couple of holding calls that backed them up on returns. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like there was a lot of just nuanced things as well that I think went went wrong. And so I would say that special teams during the course of this week now is going to be a point of emphasis because they were they did not look sharp there for the most part. Yep. Okay. All right, let's keep digging through here. There's a okay. lot to lot to dig through here. Oh my god! A meaty Judd's camp notebook. Just absolutely incredible. All right, I want to talk about the big dime. And as I talk about the big dime, I want to talk about the defensive line because I think that there's going to be genuine excitement. And remember, Brian Flores has sub-packages upon sub-packages that we have not seen. Like, I don't think the Vikings, I think you could count on one hand how often this team has played dime in like the last 15 years. Because when I cover the Packers, They played a ton of dime. And I remember even back then when they played the Vikings, the Vikings played a ton of nickel, which everybody does, right? But the Vikings now have a nickel package, a big nickel package, a dime package, a big Mm. dime. But let's talk about the defensive line. So we're talking about you want to get pressure here, right? A lot of receivers out there, a lot of quick receivers out there. 
And you are bringing in guys, and you are like, okay, the defensive line, we need to get home if possible. Yesterday in the big dime, left to right, DJ Wanham, Patrick Jones, the second inside, Marcus Davenport inside, Daniil Hunter, oh. the linebacker on the right side. What I'm saying is it's wait, all wait. pass rushers. So you're, holy cow, so your big dime is four edge rushers. Yes. Wanham's, oh. Wanham's not, Wanham is an edge rusher, but he's not a great pass rusher, So he, but he's kind of a hybrid. But it's his job. But it's like his, he's supposed yeah, to. it's his job. Yep. And then, so four pass rushers and then seven guys roaming around covering oh whoa what do we oh, have on the boy. Screen? oh my gosh we have a graphic our oh, graphics my, department oh my god it's football <laughs> i'm gonna cry <laughs> I, I googled oh my gosh big dime and this was the first <laughs> this was the first picture that showed up on google so it's so the m is a middle it could be a middle linebacker or it could be a big a big safety right uh, and then the D, the, in this case, the DTs are actually edge rushers for the YouTube audience. So yes. The, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And and so what the big dime is though, Dex, if you can leave that up for a second. Oh yeah. It's three safeties and three corner. It's three safeties, three corners. So that's six. Mm-hmm. Uh, four guys on the line, and then a linebacker stays in. Okay, so your so D, in this case your your DB on the right there would be a safety, correct? And then your uh, on the left your NB would be your nickelback, your cornerback, right? Yep. And so your M your M would be like Brian Asamoah or whoever. Yeah. So who was the who was the M? Was it Os- was I think it, it was, uh, no, no, I think it was I think it was Hicks. Okay. I I think it was Hicks. So so the thing is, people want to dismiss Hicks, but they kept him around to stabilize things. Okay. Mm-hmm. So like their theory is. With the big dime, we've got a ton of athletic talent and guys that can buzz around, but we need a veteran presence as well. So, like, people are, are like, oh, Hicks, is he, he's going to be cut. He's a, I don't think so. I think that Jordan Hicks is seen as the stabilizer here. And I think that Flores is trying to walk the fine line of, yes, a ton of athletic talent that can provide different looks, but what Jordan Hicks does is he's got the green dot, and, like, he's the guy who, if all hell breaks loose, can call a timeout. Like, he'll mm-hmm. – y- if you make that pace or or Asamoa, you're basically telling Harrison Smith, hey, 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 buddy, do it all. So, and the big dime, just to talk about the back end for a second, it's Josh Metellus, Cam Bynum, Harrison Smith, Byron Murphy Jr. inside, Makai Blackman outside, a Caleb Evans outside. Okay. Wow. This is great. Can you go through uh, go through the big dime one more time, just like from from the the, the heavies front? up front all the way back? I want to hear. Okay. This. Okay. Left to right on the defensive line: DJ Wadham, Pat Jones the second, mm. Marcus Davenport. So both Jones and Davenport inside. They're and inside. Deniel, and Daniil and Davenport and, on the same side. Yes, and Daniil on the right that. side, not the left side. Daniil Hunter, that. I think. I think, and I've said this before. But I think with Flores, it's finally going to come to fruition. I think Hunter is going to line up a lot of places. Like Dude, I, real quick, mm-hmm. uh, on, on the formation you just sent out there. So for the audience here, this is what's going to happen when you have Daniil Hunter and Marcus Davenport lining up on the same side of the formation. Those are what's called, to offensive linemen, those are called known edge rushers. Mm. So they so the, the mm. people of here. interest stick with me here. All right, football. <laughs> yeah, that's great. This is what happens when you hang out with Alex Boone for two years. Okay, I love it. Bring it on. So offensive linemen will identify. There's a difference between DJ Wanham and Daniil Hunter as they're lining up. Okay, they're not just walking up saying there are four bodies in front right. of us. What do we do with those four bodies? Right. They are saying to themselves, and this is all in the week long prep, right? For the Vikings, the known edge rushers would be Daniil Hunter for sure, and I think they would identify Marcus Davenport also as a known edge rusher. Very rarely, only with like an elite right or left tackle, would you want to regularly have those guys on an island against one guy. If you put those two known edge rushers on the same side of the formation, what's going to almost certainly happen is you're going to go tackle, guard, and the center's probably going to slide, or you're going to have like tight end chip help or whatever it is taking a, a route runner out of the equation, right? Right. You're not. You're you're likely not going to leave two offensive linemen alone against two known edge rushers in that situation. You'd probably slide the center to left. 
and that leaves a right guard and a and a right tackle mm-hmm. lined up on two edge rushers, right? I mean, Patrick Jones one on one against a guard can do some damage, I'm sure. Exactly. But it but it opens up the possibility for linebacker, big safety, corner oh. blitz to come through unabated or against a running back, right? Trying to pick up a blitz. And or if you send multiple, it just it opens up the other side for chaos, is what I'm telling you. Football. And imagine wow. this. Because I've seen this too. Imagine this one. So all of the things that you just talked about that probably would be on tape at some point in time, all of those things will transpire. But what they've also done then is a late shift. So like imagine Davenport. So like they overload the left side and Davenport now stunts or comes over at the last second. My God. Twist, and now you've twist, got a yeah. known edge oh. rusher who twisting. is loose. He's twisting. Football. Chaos. There's a lot. There's a ton Twist. of things. They'll get beat at times. Like I'm, I'm, you know, there will be things that go wrong. But I think people are going to love the effort here. Mercy. Yeah. This Mercy. is. Fun. It's. It's the very least. It's so different. It's so much fun to follow. And we'll see. I wonder how much they're going to unveil against the Titans in a, in a joint practice. Are they going to get a little chaotic? Test some of these things out. I think that's where you would do it. Because that film doesn't. That film doesn't exist for all the other teams to watch. It's just film for that practice, right? Right, sure, that's like my other teams could probably get a hold of it, but I don't know they can though because I I think okay. that that's just Titans. Fi- I think it's Titans film and Vikings film, and, and so fans, you do and fans with cameras, I guess. Yeah, but yeah, but I mean, it, I I think at some point in time, the, the reason why these joint practices to me are so intriguing is because of that though, because they do they, they offer an opportunity in a controlled environment because there won't be tackling to the ground. Yeah, so it's not going to be it's going to be aggressive, but it's not going to be like game aggressive. So it's going to offer up opportunities. But, you know, at some point in time, too, and I don't think that they're going to play enough uh, vets in games to care about this, but at some point in time, too, with this group of first-team guys, you want to practice this stuff live as much as possible because it's not like it's not like it's old hat at this point. Like, offensively, yeah. there's things that guys know now, right? This defense is asking a lot. And keep in mind, too, it's a lot of younger guys who are fast, athletic, but you mm. want them to be as repped as much as possible. Yep. Yeah, you want them to be organized and kind of know know where organized they're going. Chaos. And some of these guys are being asked too to like bail back into coverage. Yeah. They're gonna they're gonna start up at the line of scrimmage and then bail back into coverage. They need to figure out, okay, like yeah. how long does it take me to get well, to where I need to be and and that stuff. That, that didn't happen last year as much in the in the Donatel system. And assuming age is not a problem, I'm going to tell you right now, Harrison Smith is going to be back. Like, seeing him now, he's doing all the stuff and more that he used to do. This this whole two-deep shell thing, for him, is dead. Like, he is now, he is at, at the line of scrimmage, bails back, um, he creeps up and blitzes. Like, there is, he is going to be, again, assuming he could still play at the rate he did about three years ago, he is going to be an absolute nightmare in what Brian Flores is going to do. He's not going to have as many picks, but I guarantee you there's going to be some sacks and his pressure rates are going to go off the charts compared to what we didn't see last year. I love it. Love it. All right. I got some more positive news. Well, this starts starts with sort of a downer a little bit, but then it picks up, okay? Andrew Booth Jr., firmly second-team right corner. Like, he's not getting any first-team work that continues to be the case. Definitely had a rough game against the Seahawks. Gave up a touchdown uh, that was in man coverage that was pretty brutal. Uh, He had an interception yesterday about halfway through practice that he actually tipped up and Tristan Jackson caught. And it's like, oh, boy, here we go again. It's been a miserable camp. But at the end of practice, had a very nice pick of a Nick Mullins pass. I think it was in a two-minute drill that was pretty impressive. Mm-hmm. So, like, this is the first. There, there have not been a lot of Andrew Booth Jr. highlights in training camp 2023, but He's this was a, a nice pulse. play. Exactly right. He's showing some fight. Like, you want him to fight back. And yes. that was that was a nice play. That was a very nice pick. And I feel like in anything he does positive, 
has to be pointed out because the training camp has felt like such a bummer overall for Andrew Booth Jr. Yeah, and there's a reason why Andrew Booth Jr. was a second-round draft pick. There's a reason why Ed Ingram was a second- or third-round draft pick, right? These guys were talented. These guys, and the Vikings weren't the only team that had these guys pretty high on draft boards. But it's just been so negative so far for the, I mean, Andrew Booth with injuries and and then Ed Ingram leading the league in pressures allowed last year. So it's it'd be nice to see a little bit of forward momentum from some of these guys that we have no choice right now other than to shrug our shoulders and say, what you know, what are we doing here? Hope it works. Some of these guys. Yeah. Hope it works. All right. The last thing in the first part of notes, that's right, I've divided them up into subsections. Oh, yeah. I was wondering. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it's we subsections. Know where we were at here. Oh, okay. Okay. It's subsections. Yeah, oh, no, no. I've act got, one. Can we call it act one of Judd's Camp Notes? It's act one, yeah, because act two is a, is a developing soap opera at TCO, but we'll get to that in a second. All right. Um, the clock is ticking as far as, and this does not mean that the roster spots are in jeopardy, just to be clear here, okay? But... Wide receiver Jalen Naylor, a sixth-round pick in 2022, who I think we all like, has not practiced still. He's not back still since yeah. the first day of training camp practice. And Kane Wongwu, who also did not play on Thursday and was being counted on to challenge Ty Chandler for the backup job to Madison, has not practiced for about two weeks as well. So at some point in time, they're either going to get back on the field or they're going to have to start the season on, you know, on some type of list. So I would say this. My expectation was that Naylor would be one of the five receivers that they keep. At the rate things are going, I think it's probably Brandon Powell and Rager who get kept. Wow. Now, Rager didn't have a good practice again yesterday. And so I do think that he is far from a lock. And I also think that when Naylor is prepared to come back, he could bump Rager back out. But the point is, you know, Ty Chandler right now is the clear number two back because Wang Wu is a non-factor. He's not practicing. Yeah. And Jalen Naylor, at the rate things are going, I have a hard time believing if he's not back fairly soon that he's going to start the season on the active roster. Again, I don't expect them to be cut. But I do expect that the thinking process about their chances to at least make the first 53 are going to be um, pretty much a long shot if they don't get back soon. Well, and it buys you time, right? What are the what are the rules for the like when you put a guy in injury reserve to start the season now? Is it I think it's three games. He has to miss three yeah, games now. It used to be like, like six that. or eight. But you could you could buy yourself time at this point, especially you know, you know Naylor's not like a a guy you're going to rely on, he would likely be deactivated on Sunday anyways at this point. Even like last year, he was mostly inactive, right, mm-hmm. for a lot of games. So you can buy yourself some time here for the first month of the season and say, hey, man, you know, you've missed three weeks of training camp. Let's not rush this thing. Let's easy win. We still like you. But let's definitely uh, let's be eyeing October for maybe a return to the main roster. And now you buy yourself two months to look at Powell. And if if he just doesn't have it as a return guy in the first three weeks of the season, you can cut him without any sort of, uh, you know, guilty feelings. Right. This might actually work out okay for the Vikings yeah. if they just start the season with Naylor on injury reserve. Yep. I, I just think the most important thing uh, from the Rager standpoint is consistency. It yeah. just doesn't seem to be. He'll look good, good in some practices or he'll look good at times in games, but I think that there's an overall lack of consistency there. Uh, but I... I'm not going to be absolutely shocked if he actually now makes the 53 unless there's a young guy that they really like. Like, Tristan Jackson looks good, but I, I don't know. I mean, he's probably an easy practice squad guy as well. Okay. All right. Well, act one That's of act Judd's one. camp Over. notes right there. Presented in part by our friends at UglyDeck.com. Uglydeck.com. Oh, roll that. Roll that B-roll, baby. Roll that party because you know what? That's Ugly dangerous. deck. Get, the, get that dangerous loose railing fixed, Mike. Now there's me. Yeah, but see? It's all fixed. And look at the party now. Look yep. at that party. And you know what? A, a maintenance-free deck can be expensive. But what if I told you that there is a way to save, and I'll say this slowly because it's a lot, 10 
thousand dollars even if you think you can't build a deck yourself uglydeck.com is the diy assist program where ugly deck installs your footings and ledger designs and assists with your project and you finish the deck and you save thousands you get a free that's right free diy coach is going to help you from start to finish look at that beauty it's so easy even sports dad can do it Half of the UglyDeck.com DIY customers have never framed a deck before, but you can DIY it with their help. Average savings come out to between 10 and 11 grand. If you go to their site, you can pick out your deck and check all the great national brand products that they carry. So you can have a deck just like that. Right now, they are, they have their uh, fall promo, $500 off. Just tell them Judd sent you, or you heard about it on this fine show here, Purple Daily. Late summer and fall, perfect time to build a deck. So get started now. On their website, go to UglyDeck.com, click on DIY, and throw yourself a party on your brand new beautiful deck. Beautiful decks. UglyDeck.com. Also, uh, AG1 is here to help spike your week, spike your day. Nutritional insurance to start your day. AG1 has been amazing for me over the past six years or so. Uh, It's just so easy to wake up in the morning pour a big glass of water or a bottle of water and a scoop of AG1, which gives me 75 high quality ingredients and important daily nutrients. You know, the travel packs as well, when you're on the road, like next week, I'm gonna be at, I'm gonna be in Denver for podcast movement, you know, convention. Like I'm gonna bring some AG1 packs so that, I, cause I'm not gonna be able to get the fruits and vegetables and stuff that I'm already sort of bad at getting when I'm traveling. So let's just, Let's just hedge with some nutritional insurance here. And that's where AG1 comes in. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, AG1 is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash purple daily. That's drinkag1.com slash purple daily. Check it out. All right. Act number two here of Judd's Camp Notes. Act number two, as promised previously, is a soap opera at TCO. And Declan, if you would be uh, so kind as to play the head coach talking about one of the Vikings tight ends. I don't want to, you know, cause any major headlines, but uh, I believe Johnny Munt's the best third tight end in the National Football League. If, if there was a category for that, um, Johnny would certainly get that, in my opinion. Um, so reliable, so trusted by not only myself, but... Uh, Everybody in that huddle with him, um, the variety of jobs he can do on all three downs, uh, doesn't get enough credit for how well he runs uh, or blocks for that matter, physicality. Let's hear it for Johnny Munt, the best third tight end in the National Football League. Antonio Gates, Ben Coates, you're called Ben Coates. You got Gronk, and here comes Johnny Munt. Yeah. Well, so, those guys, those guys, you put those guys in the third tight end role and see what's up. It's not easy being a third tight end in the National and, Football no. League. And who's the guy that told you a year ago about Johnny Munt, huh? Who's the guy that went out to a couple of spring practices? You're going to hang your head on this one. Came back. I am going to dislocate my shoulder, patting myself on the back. But there's more here. There's more here. I found this to be very interesting. That response was to a question about Munt, but... It never even implied. Like O'Connell took the question and went like went to the moon with it, right? Like the best third tight end. That's a you know, I mean, that's pretty good praise right there. And they're not cutting him right now, right? There's no way he gets cut. Well, there's right? no way he gets cut, but the interesting thing too is um and Munt has gotten a ton of first team work. So so make no mistake here, okay? Josh Oliver is here to block. He'll catch some passes, but he is here primarily to block. Johnny Mutt, who I believe, Phil, if I'm correct, uh, by recall, going back to your PFF um, reading of the grades last year, not a great blocker, but he can certainly catch the ball, okay? Mm -hmm. And that leads us to something else that's been going on now for, oh boy, is it 10 days? TJ Hawkinson continues to come out for practice. He continues to take part in individuals, including in full pads on Sunday. And then he continues to leave the field for team drills. Now, O'Connell still is talking about it being an illness. Oh, and and uh, our friend Kevin Seifert of ESPN asked O'Connell about TJ Hawkinson playing on Saturday. O'Connell never said illness this time, but he said he's, good, he's working with the trainers to get back. Um, I don't doubt that he might be might have been sick. But this would be the longest sickness in which in which you can do certain things in practice in the in the history of football. 
Like if yeah. it was if it was a tweaked ankle or something, right? You'd be like, okay, they don't want him in team drills. Um, all I'm saying is it's a real leap of faith, in my opinion, to think this has nothing to do with his contract. And keep in mind, um, Ingram of Jacksonville and Cole Komet of the Bears, tight ends, both got paid in July. And TJ Hawkinson has a case, I think, that he is probably a better player than both of those guys, okay? Yep. So I'm not saying they haven't found something wrong, but when you listen to O'Connell's response on Saturday, it also sounded a lot like how he framed up the Daniil Hunter stuff. Because, you know, coaches don't come out and confirm, yeah, it's contractual, this guy ain't going to, right? Like, O'Connell, he didn't try to hide it, but he also didn't really address it. And he said throughout the Hunter thing that Hunter had a plan to work with the athletic trainers, like just to keep in shape and stuff like that. This is sounding a lot like that. All I'm saying is I, I feel like I would be doing the Purple Daily viewership and listenership a disservice to come on here and say, yeah, you know what? It's just a, it's, it, it's a sickness. Nothing yeah. to see here. There are other people in this market deal. to do that. I'm going to tell you right now, I have to believe this is contractual. And the last thing that's interesting is Doogie keeps alluding to the fact that this has like become the top priority contractually. Yeah. So I keep wondering if things got close and then fell apart a bit or what, but there are too many connect the dots here to dismiss uh, TJ Hawkinson's contract, at least playing a role in his just complete absence for a couple weeks, it feels like, the team draws. I'm okay with this as long as yeah. there's a solution and a, like, and a resolution in sight. I don't, I guess where I'm at with this is I don't know why the Vikings wouldn't want to extend him. He's in his mid 20s, he's in the second tier of. Pass catching tight ends. He's he's not quite on the George Kittle, you know, Travis Kelsey level, but he's definitely on the fringes of being a top five pass catching tight end in the NFL, with probably room to grow in this system with an mm -hmm. accurate quarterback in Kirk Cousins, Justin Jefferson taking some of the attention off, and there's a good chance that he's a one thousand yard receiving tight end starting in two thousand twenty three, mm -hmm. and he's young, like we said. The Vikings should want to lock him up with some. When I say cost control, I mean like knowing what he costs for the next few years. So I, I would think the only the only issue would be is he looking for the biggest contract among all tight ends because hey he's next on the conveyor belt of extensions and the Vikings are saying well right. I don't know we're we're probably going to be you know more in that like you know three four five range in terms of tight end salary rankings but you know I would think that both sides would want to continue forward with a contract and if he needs to sit out for a little bit to prevent you know tearing a hamstring or something. I don't have a huge problem with this, but how long is this going to linger? Right. You know, how long are we going to be a week before the season? The guy hasn't done any meaningful practice yet. Like he's, he, it's not like he's been in the system for five years. This mm -hmm. is the first full off season that he gets to soak things in and work with Kirk cousins and whatever. So these are valuable practices, even for a, a veteran like TJ Hawkinson, because he's not a veteran of this offensive system yet. Exactly. Right. And, and just for, uh, Comparison's sake of the two guys I talked about who got tight ends, who got contract extensions in July. Cole Komet of the Bears, four years, $50 million, 32 guaranteed. And the, obviously the guarantee is the most important thing. Evan Ingram, tight end from the Jaguars, three years, $41.25 million, 24 guaranteed. Ingram's average salary on this new contract, $13.75 million, is sixth among tight ends. Komet's at 12.5 is tied for ninth. Yeah. And so Hawkinson's now behind them. So anyway, yeah, I'm not like super concerned, but I'm just saying there there's something here. Like yeah. there's no way that this is just the longest possible illness that allows him to sort of practice but not fully practice. Like if he had disappeared completely, I'd be more like, okay, he must be really sick. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. Like if you're and if you're that you've been sick for 10 days, if it's really really bad, you probably aren't even out there like it's right. it's a it's a weird deal. Okay. Well, right. Keep an eye on it. All right. I got a couple names to watch in preseason games because I think there are guys emerging. Oh, I think wow. there are guys emerging. And I, I don't want to say that these guys are emerging for starting jobs, but, you know, I'm out there to serve 
the PD family, right? I'm mm-hmm. out there to I'm out there to pick up on any like I assume if you are watching the show, you care about every nuance that involves your fit your favorite team, and that's what I'm going to give you here. Um, number fifty seven is a linebacker by the name of Wilson Huber. He was actually signed as a UDFA out of Cincinnati and was teammates with Pace. He had a uh, he had a pick on a goal line drill, a front corner of the end zone against Mullins on Sunday, and he's getting some serious reps. Like they clearly, I think he's ascended. Ordinarily, a guy like that would get some reps, but yeah. probably wouldn't play a big role. He was he's getting second team reps, which is pretty damn good. Fifty seven, Wilson Huber. Watch him as a dark horse to make the roster. I'm not wow. saying okay. that he's going to start, but I'm just, I think there's something there. And whatever they did, it appears like with the Bearcats to develop their linebackers has worked out pretty damn well. The other one, and I've been talking about this guy for about a week and a half now, but anyway, number 25, Theo Jackson. Mm-hmm. The safety who I thought was impressive against the Seahawks on Thursday. So when training camp started, Josh Martellus was with the first team in the big nickel, but then he was paired with Seen on the second team at safety. Mm-hmm. And so he he was playing, Metellus was playing traditional safety um, with the second team. Theo Jackson, and this is not anything wrong with what Metellus has done, Theo Jackson has replaced him there. And I got a feeling, and this is just a creeping feeling, it's just my own personal analysis, that Theo Jackson privately is very much challenging scenes spot on the depth chart. Again, scenes going to make the team. So is Booth, mm-hmm. okay? So I don't mean to say no one's getting cut here. Yeah. But I think Theo Jackson Theo Jackson plays like they wanted they want scene to. And I think the most important difference is this. Theo Jackson, his instincts appear to be good. I would say if there's one complaint with scene, just a starting point complaint, his instincts aren't great. Like he's trying to fly all over the field. He's trying to make plays. God bless him. But I don't know. I don't know. He is that scene uses his um, his energy the right way. If that makes sense. Yeah. Theo Jackson seems to be in the right place at the right time to jack guys up. I think Theo Jackson is challenging where scene is as far as the depth chart goes. Total yeah, speculation. So- no, it's uh, it's no, it's not total speculation. It's ed- it's educated speculation because you're watching these practices and you've kind of been on Theo Jackson for a few weeks. So there's certain guys you can tell on the linebacker thing real quick. The two Cincinnati linebackers, that is probably the least experienced position on the team. You know, you take away Jordan Hicks and it's just like a bunch of kids running around who've really never played meaningful defensive snaps. So that one doesn't surprise me that there would be guys that are just going to pop up because they. They didn't sign any linebackers in free agency. They said, all right, Jordan Hicks is coming back, and then we're just right. going to figure it out with – and they didn't draft anyone. We're just going to figure Reader. it out with yep. – Hey, Troy, join our team. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, they didn't sign anyone meaningful, I should say, like who's a bona fide starter. Right. On the defensive back front, I think where it gets really interesting is you have first and second round picks and how much our egos attached to – I agree with you. You're not cutting these guys because financially it doesn't make sense to. Right. But – how much do front office egos and what what maybe Quasi's opinion of a player was in the first and second round, how much does that weigh in when some of these guys that weren't high draft picks are outplaying them during these practices? Mm-hmm. That's going to be such an interesting thing. You know, if Lewis Seen isn't good enough, but he was a first round pick and you, you traded 20 slots back and you drafted him because you thought he was going to be Kyle Hamilton and... Now he's not. Can you move off of that? If you were wrong, can you move off of that depth chart wise going into the second year? You know, that's such an interesting potential early conundrum for KOC and Quasi. Yeah. And I think the difference here is again, I'd be very curious to know what the hiring conversation ultimately was like for Brian Flores. Cause I think Brian Flores, he's not screwing around here. My guess is that guys that might have been more of a conundrum, right, with Donatel and, like, KOC and Quasi. I think Brian's going to say, guys, 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 your defense sucked. You hired me to coach this defense. Let me coach this defense. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, they are – the practices – I mean, KOC again on Saturday referred to the Brian Flores experience, okay? 
And there were par- there were portions of practice on Sunday where the head coach was clearly just from watching his body language from a distance was not pleased. And part of it's because the defense is putting on this unbelievable ab- amount of pressure, right? So I, I think I think there's a chance that the egos might be removed a little bit more by a defensive coordinator who said, "You hired me to do this. I took the job. You're yeah. probably pretty fortunate I did. We're going to do this my way." Yeah. The other the other crazy thing about Brian Flores is he's actually a more experienced head coach than Kevin O'Connell too, because yeah. he was head coach for three years. We're going into Kevin O'Connell's second year, so I think. I'd love to be a fly on the wall for some of the Flores KOC discussions behind the scenes. I I'm not suggesting that there's like tension or anything. By all accounts, those guys are getting along very well, and mm-hmm. Kevin O'Connell is letting Brian Flores kind of roam around and run the defense. And he even refers, oftentimes at press conferences, to Flores's guys or Flores's defense. It's very much. I mean, Brian Flores is basically the head coach of the defense, much like when when you know ten years ago when Mike Zimmer was hired. Norv Turner was the head coach of the offense because Norv Turner was a 30-year offensive guy with more head coaching experience. But does it come at the expense of the offense trying to get their stuff in, you know, during these practices? I don't know. Yeah. You know, only KOC. And he would, I don't think KOC would ever come out publicly and be like, you know what? Our defense is making it hard for us to install our offense during these practices. No, hell no. <laughs> in fact, but he Kirk should be Cousins pleased. clearly feels that he way. He does want to be challenged. I just think that there were there were definitely uh, plays on Sunday that didn't go as he anticipated, and so like like you could just see the sigh of, <sighs> damn it! But that's yeah. a football guy. Yeah, you also get the Buccaneers in Week One, so I'm sure you'll yeah. figure it out. Mm-hmm. Exactly right. Exactly right. All right, we are on to Act Four, which we will call setting the record straight. Okay, setting the record straight. All right, so let's start with this. Three parts to Act Four. Let's start with this one. So Kareem Hunt, the veteran running back, adept at catching and and running the ball, but a man with baggage, was brought in for a visit on Friday. That makes it three guys now. Dalton Reisner this month came in. He's a guard. We, we actually thought at the time he, he might be signed immediately. He was not. Ronald Darby, a veteran cornerback, brought in, and now Hunt. What does it mean? I think this is exactly what it means, okay? The Vikings are, first of all, teams bring in guys, not high-profile guys, but guys are brought in constantly. So, like, bringing a guy in is not surprising. These are three big names, so, yes, that makes a little bit of a difference. But I think what this means is the Vikings are doing their due diligence on every position where they're not comfortable with their depth. Yep. So it's not like they're here to sign immediately, but at all three spots, guard, running back, cornerback. I don't think that they're super comfortable either with depth or at least with age. In, in the case of cornerbacks, I think the oldest cornerback, the oldest cornerbacks are Byron Murphy Jr. and Joan Williams at 25, which is yes. not old. So mm-hmm. I think in all three cases, these aren't like, oh, my God, we have to immediately sign player X. I think this is we need to have a file. So if guys get hurt or in the case of the guards, let's just say struggle. We have an option of a guy who we are now familiar with. So I think that that's what it means. I don't think it means that that signings are imminent. I think what it's telling us is this team knows that it has, it lacks depth. It lacks, it's got concerns. So at least they're trying to ease their mind by saying we could potentially go out and make a move to sign this guy, worst case scenario. Yes. And by the way, Kareem Hunt did not sign. He was, I know he was visiting with the Saints. And Colts. Um, but he is still a free agent even after the visit, right? He has not signed. Yes, a lot of baggage there. A lot of baggage. There is. He, you know, people remember that first season, you know, before he got booted off the uh, the Kansas City roster for was it the domestic assault issue? Um, but that was like six years ago. He actually led the league in rushing as a rookie in 2017 with, yeah, his, with the Andy Reid Kansas City Chiefs. Mm-hmm. I completely yeah, forgot and, that. And he's never really, he's always been kind of a split carries back with the Browns ever since. So last year he was down to 3.8 yards a carry in terms of yards per reception, also a career low, only six yards per reception. Now the Browns offense was just kind of a train wreck altogether. So maybe it was a product of that, but I don't know that you're getting the career. I know a lot of people are like, well, well, this is a no brainer. Why would you not sign Kareem Honey? He'd probably be your starting running back, right? 
This is, I don't think you're getting the same Kareem Hunt as you were maybe getting two years ago. Right. And if from for me, if if Ty Chandler can just be an effective number two back, I'd rather just give him the reps because I want him involved for the next two years or so. Mm-hmm. But it isn't. I think you nailed it that they're looking at some of these positions and saying, I don't know, man. Like the starters are not full blown like uh, established starters. I mean, Alex Madison we like, but we don't know if he can be a, a a workload guy. And the guys behind him have never carried before, so. So sometimes they do it, I think, too, to send a message into the locker room that, hey, just so you guys know, we got Dalton Reisner in here today, so you better step it up, Ed Ingram, Ezra Cleveland. Yeah, we yeah. saw that Kirk Cousins Netflix documentary where he was, you know, had ribs protruding through his skin, <laughs> well, writhing in pain on the ground. Yeah, Dalton in Reisner's time. in the building to help uh, fix that. Then the Fox song starts. Da-da, da-da, da. <laughs> when a guy's hurt, that slow, really sad, mundane it's the piano Fox version. Yes. This play. an injury. Is that by Geico? We're just going right. to scoop past you to commercial break there. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, speaking of Ty Chandler, part two of setting the record straight involves some of Declan's favorite thing, which is the give and take between young Kevin O'Connell and and veteran grizzly Judd Zolgad, a.k.a. Sports Dad, okay? So on Saturday, I just came out and asked two questions. Ty Chandler, first of all. I said you, I believe it was at halftime on Channel 9, I said you basically said that Ty Chandler has to do this when the lights are on. And I said my interpretation of that is you are not necessarily pleased with him in practice. Is that an accurate interpretation? He said no. He said we are feeding this kid a lot. He sort of dodged the whole thing, but he said, we're feeding this kid a lot. Uh, We're asking a lot. We have no problem with how he is practicing. So that runs a little bit counter to what I thought I had seen in practices. And I actually thought the Ty Chandler's practice on Sunday was a lot more intense. And clearly O'Connell's not going to come out and, and rip the kid publicly. I get that. But I did feel that when a coach refers to showing it when the lights are on, that that's a definite sort of hint about we need to see this more consistently. O'Connell said no. And I also said, I asked about Ed Ingram's play and said it was a great debate on Twitter because there were a lot of folks who said he was terrible. There were some who said he was okay. And I said, what's the what's the skinny on how Ingram played and why did he play when the rest of the starting offensive line did not? O'Connell said a lot of second-year guys were going to play, that that was not a punishment. Yeah. And on Ingram's play, he said he actually did a lot of good things. Um, what he alluded to, and this is, and look, just to be very clear here, I'm not standing up for Ed. I have no idea. He needs to show a ton more. So I'm, I am the messenger here. Don't shoot me for this one. But what he, what O'Connell alluded to was the fact that there were times when there was miscommunication, and Bradbury was not playing. Center And O'Connell talked about the fact that the communication does not always have to come from th- that spot. He basically said, we want Ingram, if he knows something, to take control as well. But he uh, he said, I thought, w- what his point was, was that Ingram actually, that there were more struggles with communication than actual physical fundamentals. Again, I am the messenger. I am not saying that. Well, Pro Football Focus has the grades out. We could have done a Judd guesses the PFF grades here, but uh, I'll just give them to you. Okay. So Ed Ingram, let's see here. Pass blocking. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten Vikings offensive linemen played snaps, like fairly meaningful snaps in this game. Mm-hmm. Ed Ingram ranked ninth in pass block grade out of the ten. Yeah, it didn't feel like he played well. So he uh, And you know what? Old Macadac has a couple offensive line sources around uh, around the football sphere. Nah, not in love with the way that he played. People that are smarter than us who have right who who can who can say better than us said eh, it was kind of a kind of a rough one for old uh, for old Eddie, especially against backup defensive linemen too. Correct. So and there's also a reason why you're bringing Dalton Reisner in for a visit. I know Dalton Reisner is a left guard, but like you're not just. They're not bringing wide receivers in for visits. Last I checked, I don't nope. think you know they're nope. They're not bringing, I don't know. They're not bringing quarterbacks in for visits. Not that there are any out there that are you know 
just sitting out there waiting to be plucked. But Brett Favre, Brett Favre is waiting to be. Well, yeah. he's waiting to be plucked by. Yeah, the, and I'm uh, not defending the grand Ed. Jury, but I'm not defending Ed. And and I did find it intriguing that the head coach talked about communication problems. But I just thought I would ask to get it on the record the yeah. fact that he felt he did some good good things. But yes, I have not. Uh, it's not like I've talked to a litany of folks who said, "Oh man, he played well." The majority of people I talked to who watched the tape said, "Yeah, it was okay at best and and bad at worst." Yeah. So wow, dude, what a notebook! What a I'm, notebook! I got one more. I got Do you one, have one more? more. You know what? Okay. This last notebook item is sponsored by our friends at Livia. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which, by the way, congratulations, was just named Minnesota's best weight loss program for the third year in a row. And there's an example, if you're watching this on YouTube, of the reason why. There's an example. That's Sports Dad on the left. It's Sports Dad on the right. What's the difference you're saying to yourself? Boy, Sports Dad, you look a little bit different. Not just the clean-shaven Sports Dad on the, the right, but 40 pounds down there. This is a program that works, and this is now three years gold and 14 years of changing live. Lives and three years gold means three months free if you join today. Yes, I said that. Three months free if you join today. Experience what I experienced and what so many people who watch our shows have experienced. And that is the weight loss that is provided here. This program works. 855-GO-L-I-V-E-A, Livia.com, L-I-V-E-A.com. Three months free. And it is a limited time offer, so join today. But again, congratulations. Three years gold. Livia works. And a lot of people can tell you that. You know what else works? Federated Mutual Insurance Company. Ooh, yeah. They work for your business. They work to provide a guiding hand, risk management tools and resources. And also, uh, they, they offer marketers, underwriters, risk management personnel, claims professionals, all under one name. Their mutual structure allows them to devote their full attention to the best interests of you, the business owner. You can check them out at federatedinsurance.com. They have a list of industries that they specialize in. And if your industry matches, then maybe you should reach out to your local marketing rep, federatedinsurance.com, where it's our business to protect yours. And with that, Judd's final note here okay. on this Monday Judd's Camp Notes episode. So the next uh, two weeks, Wednesday and Thursday, I think both weeks, the Vikings are going to have joint practices with the Titans. And then a week from now, it's going to be the Cardinals. And then they will play home preseason games uh, against both teams. And so because of, of that and because I'm guessing – a lot of people who watch us have season tickets. I asked O'Connell, I said, is Kirk going to play at all? Like, are you going to incorporate him into the preseason? And he talked about the fact that they've got a plan for each player and that they'll see basically the work that they get in joint practices. Um, but I would say this. I would say there's probably not a snowball's chance in hell that Kirk Cousins is going to play in either game. The joint practices serve a purpose. So, mm -hmm. and I agree. Look, preseason football is... It's okay. Like, it depends. The first, it can be intriguing for about a, a half or so. But if you're going to these games to watch the games, this is now, with the new joint practice world, the preseason games, which are at three now, are all about the depth roster spots. Like, that's where you're going to see guys. And there will be second-year guys that, that play. But I think pretty much across the board, Gone are the days of, you know, the starters play in game one, they play a series. In game two, they play two. And in game three, they play a half. I think th those those days are gone, and it, it's actually smart. Uh, guys like Kirk Cousins and the first team, they need work, but they don't necessarily need game work yeah. like in a preseason game, especially if they're going against slappies who are trying to make teams, which means that those guys will take uh, runs at guys. And the other thing is, Everything that they do in the joint practices the next two weeks will be on the grass at TCO. And I would far prefer my guys in a controlled environment to play on grass than, than risk anything happening on turf. And by the way, I still don't trust turf. I know it's come a long way, but in a meaningless game. So I would say this. If you are going to these games, be prepared to watch like certain players and, and, and uh, the depth positions and those roster spots be challenged for. I don't think you are going to see, and nor do I think that you will see many starters. And I wouldn't be surprised, actually, now, uh, unless it's a depth thing, if Jordan Addison sits out the last two games as well. I think we saw all we needed to see from him. He's good. He'll be fine. Yeah. He doesn't need to be playing on turf.
Yeah. Also, just one last note on the joint practices. It's more efficient. It's more it's less dangerous and more efficient. Injuries can still happen because guys are moving close to full speed. Yep. But you're not finishing plays with tackles for one. So it's safer in that regard. But you get the full speed sort of lead up the processing, everything you need as a quarterback. And if you're like blitz picking up as a running back, whatever. Yep. So you get all the good without the bad. And you might wind up playing, let's say in the old days, you wound up playing the first quarter. You wind up playing like uh, six quarters of preseason football or something. You're not guaranteed to get a good two minute drill. You're not guaranteed to get good red zone action. You're not, you might go three and out or you get, you know, get them out of the 40 and then there's a fumble or something. You get to work on, all right, for the next 10 minutes, Mm -hmm. it's two minute drill action. For the next ten minutes or thirty minutes or whatever, it's this over here. It's exactly. it's very uh, it's very organized. I guess it's way smarter. Of, yep, it's just smarter. Yep. So wow, let's give a round of applause to Judd Zolgad here for an oh, hour long edition of got. Camp Notes today, big time. And uh, and yeah, uh, a reminder: scorenorth.com slash bid if you'd like to bid or buy. Uh, or just donate to help us raise money for the Courage Kenny Rehabilitation Institute all week long, looking to raise at least $10,000. So thank you guys in advance, and thank you for making this Purple Daily one of the most popular football podcasts in America, inexplicably. Crazy Vikings fans, uh, joint practices this week. We're both going to be out there, and uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow here on this Daily Vikings Entertainment Platform, Purple Daily.